Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Jen Kentner. I am the Education and Outreach Coordinator here at OFCC. Um, today, we are going to be going over the K-12 School Safety Grant Program for 2022 applicants. So with that, let me introduce our panelists. Um, to start from OSCC, we have Jeff Westhoven. From Ohio's Office of Budget and Management, we have Stacy Massey, Jessica Martin, and Eileen Kunkler. And then from Ohio School Safety Center, we have Kyle Neese. So at this time, I'm gonna pass the baton over to Jeff Westhoven, who is gonna kick off the presentation. All right, thanks, Jen. And good morning, everyone. You know, it, it's great to see such interest in this program. We had, I believe, over 800 register for this morning. So, uh, so welcome. You know, school safety is it's a broad topic. It's you know, prevention. There's preparedness, response, recovery. You know, it can include emergency planning and mental health, law enforcement. But you know, this program, this grant program, is focused on physical building improvements, so equipment to make your building safer. And you know, all the good work that you do in schools begins with a safe environment, and that's what this program is intended to support. So today's agenda, we'll go over the background of the program, uh, how, how to apply and kind of the reasoning behind some of the application. We will talk about how we will evaluate and award these grants. And then uh, our colleagues at OBM will, will actually go through a screen-by-screen -screen walkthrough of how to apply. These are, these are federal funds, and so we will address some of the requirements that are unique to federal funding and uh, then get to your questions at the end. Okay, so on, on the background, in the capital bill this year, uh, there was a $100 million appropriation for American Rescue Plan Act school security, or ARPA school security. And that $100 million federal funds is for grants up to $100,000 per school. And this would be for both eligible public school districts and chartered non-public schools. The language in the law allows us to consider applications from a previous grant program and it Jen referred to in the opening about the 2021 program, we'll be referring to 2021 and 2022. Uh, those for this program for 2022, uh, essentially everyone is eligible except those 95 grantees that received money, the $5 million in 2021, or schools that had construction completed through an OFCC program within the last five years. So those are the only that are really not eligible for this 2022 distribution. I'm gonna ask uh, Kyle Neese from the House School Safety Center to address this slide on the uh, past guidelines. Kyle? Sure, morning everyone. Uh, again, I'm Kyle Neese, I'm with the Ohio School Safety Center. Uh, just to give everyone a little bit of insight uh, where some of the items that you'll be looking at on the authorized equipment list, where we came up with those items, was from the uh, PASS uh, checklist, which is from the Partner Alliance for Safer Schools. It's a safety and security uh, guideline checklist, and they have four different tiers of uh, security for a school, tier one, two, three, and four. And tier one are what they have deemed uh, the baseline every school should have for fiscal security. So that aligns up with our 2022 authorized equipment list. And also um, that goes in for 2022. So any of the $100 million that is uh, used for purchases through the grant would have to be from the 2022 AEL list. And just some of the highlights from that, uh, if you've looked at the AEL list, it uh, includes cameras. Um, it also would include uh, metal detector, vape, uh, detection technology, um, cyber security, uh, uh, security items. It would also include radios, radios for buses, and also GPS tracking for buses. Okay, thanks, Kyle. And I'll, I'll move on on the on the background. So you mentioned a hundred million dollars in federal funding. It'll be uh, distributed in in two different pools. So we had mentioned the 2021 program. So those that applied previously in 2021 were not uh, awarded a grant. About 47 million has been allocated for that program. We had a webinar, webinar last week about that. About half of the schools that were eligible have already applied for that, which is good. 
Uh, some of you, I'm sure, uh, were able to attend the, the webinar last week on that. But uh, this time we'll be going down this right branch, which is the $53 million for applicants for the new program. And we'll go over how to apply. Uh, essentially, the, the application is through the Ohio Grants Partnership Portal. And whether you're a traditional K-12 district or uh, an, another type of school, the same information will be requested for the application, but it'll be a slightly different experience if you're a district versus a single school. The traditional districts will um, submit a single application on behalf of all schools in their district, while the other entities will apply just for their own school. Uh, you know, some of the common elements, uh, everyone would provide all the data elements necessary for federal reporting, including, and this may be something new for those that haven't uh, accepted federal funds yet, a unique entity identifier, or UEI. That's something that replaced what used to be uh, the DUNS number uh, in federal grants. And so that, um, we'll talk a little bit more about that. That'll be an element of the grant application. Uh, also, uh, a signed copy of terms and conditions, which includes, uh, as Kyle mentioned, a commitment to purchase items only from the 2022 authorized equipment list. And I just recognize we're using a lot of acronyms. So we use AEL uh, as the authorized equipment list, UEI is unique entity identifier. Okay. All right, so how, how to apply. Um, let's start with, you know, we mentioned the funding available, $53 million. If we receive less than that number in applications when the window closes, then we would essentially award to every complete and valid application. Uh, we then uh, reopen the application window. The program would convert to a first come first served uh, grant opportunity until the funding is all spoken for. That's if we receive less than the amount that we have available. Uh, however, we, we do expect to get more than $53 million in requests. And, and so once the, the window closes, uh, we'll know the gap between what's requested and what's available. And there will be an attempt, as we understand it, to secure more funding for the program. Uh, however, you know, the outcome of that is, is uncertain. It involves the General Assembly and, and factors outside our control. So we have to plan as if this is the extent of the funding available. And to do that, we, we default to this competitive program. Uh, each award decision is based on an individual school. So if you're a district and you're applying on behalf of you know, eight schools in your district, those will be eight individual award decisions based on what's presented for each school. Uh, each school will have a security assessment, which Kyle will uh, talk about next. Each school will have its own equipment that's requested to address uh, those vulnerabilities. And then uh, you as an applicant have a chance to write a narrative that connects those two and it talks about you know, why it is that we're requesting this equipment and how it addresses those vulnerabilities. On the assessment, I'm gonna ask Kyle again to, to go through the 2022 Security and Vulnerability Assessment, another, another acronym, SBA. Sure, for the uh, 2022 grant, for the, uh, to complete this, you have to have a Security and Vulnerability Assessment um, for 2022. If you've already had a the 2021 uh, security and vulnerability assessment form uh, for the grant from last year, you can use that grant. I'm sorry, you can use the SVA uh, form from the last grant cycle, and all you would have to do is add the supplemental questionnaire to that. Um, the reason there's some supplemental questions from last year's uh, security and vulnerability assessment to this year's 2022 security and vulnerability assessment was because of the addition of some of the tier one items from that past checklist that we were talking about earlier. Again, the security and vulnerability assessments uh, are pretty easy to complete. They're yes and no questions. You'd have a total score at the end, and then the uh, SVA would be signed by an auth uh, authorized school official. Um, that being said, the SVAs need to be completed by either experienced security, law enforcement, or military personnel. So your local sheriff, your local police department, your school resource officer, uh, you could also reach out and uh, at, if you're having issues, especially right now with it being a heavy grant season and requests for uh, security and vulnerability assessments, we have people at the Ohio School Safety Center that can also go out and do the assessments for you. 
again, we talked about this a little bit, but you're going to have the new uh, 2022 SBA form. Uh, with that, there's 164 yes and no questions, and there's a total score at the end. So we tried to make it user friendly. So if you had a 2021 SBA form completed last year for last year's grant cycle, all you'd have to do is uh, in uh, the person submitting the grant application, so like your superintendent, whoever that person may be, they can do the supplemental questions and then add it to your 2021 SBA form. And all they would have to do is just add up the total uh, for your end score. And then you would upload your 2022 SBA form or your 2021 SBA form with the supplemental questions uh, to your application. And just to give a little back uh, history on last year's form, there was only 130 questions. So with the supplemental questions, there's an extra 34. Again, that is completed. Uh, the supplemental can be completed by anyone in the school that's applying for the grant, superintendent, principal, and then it's uploaded as one document for the new uh, 2022 grant. And this is just a what the authorized equipment list looks like for the 2022 grant. There's 44 items. Um, and just, again, I talked a little bit about highlights earlier, but you can buy cameras, uh, public address uh, systems, signage, um, GPS tracking for the vehicles and buses, um, cameras, uh, film for windows, uh, secure film for windows, uh, metal detectors, vape technology, and Again, if you have a question about uh, an authorized purchase under the program, uh, you can reach out and we'll get you the answer that we can get for you if it's authorized or not for purchase. All right, thanks. Thanks, Kyle. And, and on the narrative itself, so we talked about the vulnerability assessment and then the, the authorized equipment that you'd be requesting. The narrative is what ties these two together. It's this, It's a single, uh, field within your application, and it's your opportunity to explain, you know, uh, how what you're requesting fits your vulnerability. Um, also, you know, so we will be scoring this, and so the desired response includes that connection, uh, how it will help you as a school or as a district achieve past tier one. Uh, interesting also for federal reporting is, you know, the outcome of the funding, you know, what what results would we have to show for it? If you're able to kind of estimate, you know, how your uh, vulnerability score would increase if you did this project, uh, that would be helpful to include in your narrative as well. Um, some of you are uh, in lease space, which is fine for this grant. If you are expecting to, let's say, move out of your space within two years, or maybe you're in a, a building that is scheduled for uh, demolition in three years, what what's helpful to us is to know that whatever equipment is purchased with the grant, it would be expected to be in service for at least five years. And so if you can put in there, you know, an affirmation in your response that says, yes, we do expect this to be used for five years, or we would repurpose this equipment um, in in whatever new building we would have, and it'd still have the intended purpose, uh, that helps your application as well. Once we get to the uh, evaluation award, the deadline is October 3rd. Uh, we would expect as evaluators to review and evaluate the applications as they come in. Uh, so there's an advantage to apply early. I know there's, it's human nature to probably wait towards the end. We see kids cramming for tests. <laughs> Same thing you know, for, for these types of grant awards. When we did the last round, I think we got half of our applications in the last three days. Uh, which is which is fine to do. The thing is, as we screen these, um, we can actually give you feedback on whether an application is complete if it comes to us early enough. We want you to be successful with this grant application. Uh, we want it to be complete. We want you to be able to move on to to be able to do the evaluation. And so, if we get an application in where something is missing, um, you as an applicant won't be able to modify your application. But we on the evaluation side could, let's say, add a missing attachment, uh, for example. Uh, or the other thing is, let's say an application is um, has a lot of things that are incomplete. We, we would actually send that back and, and you would, as an applicant, get a, a notice that says your application is incomplete. 
here are the items that we saw as evaluators that are missing, and you can actually reapply before the deadline. Again, our, our thought is we, we want you to be successful. We want you to have a complete application that we can move on. So time permitting, we will try to reach out uh, to, to get the grant contact that's listed in the application if there's something that will, that will um, complete the application. Again, if it's maybe the day before, we may not be able to get to it, so earlier is better. Any of the complete applications and move on to the competitive part, and we'll talk about that on the next slide here. There is an evaluation guide that we have on our website, which explains this in more detail. But you know, the first two rows here, if required fields are completed and all the attachments are uploaded, um, there's really three parts to the competitive evaluation. And it kind of goes according to the greatest need, if you will. Uh, so the scored uh, SBA is one part of it. The success of your narrative is another part. And the third part is the Center for Disease Control has a social vulnerability index, or another, uh, ap another acronym is SVI. This has been around for about uh, 10 years. And it is uh, through the Geospatial Research Analysis and Services Program. I had to write that down. It's a long name for a federal office. They've created a database that helps emergency response planners and public health officials uh, identify and map communities that are most likely to need support before, during, and after an emergency event. So this is a uh, an index they use for emergency planning. Uh, it's based on U.S. Census tracts. Every county in Ohio has uh, a number associated with this. Uh, you can look this up. It's publicly available information and the lookup is in our evaluation guide. So you can see based on county what your index would be. That's the third part of the evaluation. Okay. And then, so as soon as the deadline closes, we will begin to roll out award recommendations. We wanna do that as soon as possible. Uh, it could be that we announce awards uh, in more than one batch, if that's how we uh, get the notice out quickly. It may be take the form of a, a press release and then a notice through the system, but you as, as applicants will um, be notified. And then the Ohio Office of Budget Management will uh, pay the approved grant amount to the applicant based on the information that's on file with the state of Ohio. And that's how, that's how the funding will reach you. Um, speaking of budget management, so I'm gonna turn it over here to uh, Jessica Martin from Ohio Grants uh, Office of Budget Management, Ohio Grants uh, Portal. And Jessica's gonna walk through kind of screen by screen the job aid uh, that you would be uh, using to help you go through the application. If you haven't seen the application yet, you, these screens would be unfamiliar to you, but the, probably the best way to use this is this job aid she's walking through is available on our website. And it's also available in the app as a guide. You can have it up on a screen as you're applying or you could even go old school and print it out you know, as you're applying, but it's a useful tool. So, um, so Jessica, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Awesome, thanks, Jeff. Um, like you mentioned, I'm Jessica Martin with the Ohio Grants Partnership team within the Ohio Office of Budget and Management. And this is um, our homepage that you would want to go to to actually complete the application. So the address is grants.ohio.gov. There's a lot of really helpful information and lots of um, current state funding opportunities out there right now. Um, and so, you know, we'll navigate you specifically to how to find um, these two opportunities for the 2022 program. So on the homepage, you would click on either the funding opportunity at the top or from the um, tile below within the grant resources. And it takes you to this page and then um, you would click on the button that says um, click here to access the active funding opportunities. Depending on when you navigate to the site, there could be a lot of different um, active opportunities that are out there right now. So you can use the different um, little uh, filters at the top to kind of filter down the list so you're not scrolling through as much. Um, in this example, I've you know filtered for the Ohio Facilities Construction Commission as the agency. And then you'll see there are two different grant opportunities available. Um, for the 2022 program. And so, you know, you want to make sure you click on the right one that applies to your school. So the first one would be for the public school districts. The second one is all other non-traditional public school district applicants. 
So after you click on one of those links, it will take you to one of these two pages. And this just gives some background information about each of the funding opportunities. Um, and then, you know, also gives you a link to go back to OFC's, OFCC's website if you need some more um, details there. And then at the bottom of the page, it will look like this. So for the traditional public school districts, um, there are you know, these five different documents required at registration. And then in the attachment section, you'll also see um, a lot of helpful information, including templates of the required documents. And then like Jeff was saying, the job aid um, that's on their website is also here. And I did wanna point out that the job aid will walk you through um, the whole process from a technical standpoint. So it's good to like reread through that when you're ready to actually go um, complete your application. Um, it'll list, you know, these documents that are required at registration. So you wanna make sure you actually um, know what you need to fill out and have that filled out before you actually go in and apply for the opportunity. Um, on the next slide, I, we did wanna point out that the, um, Traditional public schools will have an Excel document that they fill out with all of the schools listed and some of the information is formatted this way because there will be multiple school buildings. And so, you know, just make sure you have this completed for all the schools um, prior to going in and submitting your application. And then on the next slide, so all the other applicants um, there are four documents that are required, or I guess could be required. One would be the SVA supplemental question. So if you get a 2022 SVA, you know, that one wouldn't be um, required. But um, same thing where in the attachment section on this page, you would see all the templates, some pertinent information, and then the job aid as well, which will, you know, explain everything that we're explaining today from a technical standpoint in this webinar. So once you've um, you know, gotten all the documents you need, filled it all out, prepared, then you would go in and click on register for this funding opportunity, the button at the bottom. And you can even go look at it beforehand, but um, the oper or this application does need to be completed in one sitting. So that's why we're emphasizing, you know, make sure you get all your documents filled out, um, scanned or filled out electronically, saved appropriately um, before you're actually ready to go in and hit submit. So on the first part of the application, you'll fill out the information about your entity. So it could be the school district, if it's a public school district, or you know, you just your school. And you will um, include your unique entity identifier, UEI. I know Jeff mentioned it earlier, and then Stacy is gonna go into a little bit more detail about it on a later screen. The next step would be associating your um, state of Ohio supplier ID. So um, Jeff mentioned this, but whatever um, method you are currently getting your funding, probably through the Department of Education, you know, the supplier ID would be associated with your banking information. So if you do not currently have a supplier ID, um, you can reach out to the supplier team to help get that set up. And there's actually a link um, on that page. Um, but uh, if once you have it set up, then you can go and you can search for it by either your ID number or a couple letters from your supplier name. And it will give you a whole list of options. So, you know, many school districts and schools may have similar names um, or your, your area may have multiple locations. So just make sure you select the correct address um, when you are associating that. So there are um, different additional questions because um, you know it's just formatted a bit differently for the traditional public school districts because they're doing that Excel document and additionally versus the other applications who would fill more of the information out in um, this part of the application. So, um, and like we were mentioning, the job aid does have these questions listed so that, you know, you don't have to take a little screenshot of this tiny screen. You can go in and see that so you can prepare um, for what you'll have to fill out, you know, whether you need to copy paste it in or, um, you know, have it on some other document. But these are the questions that um, Jeff kind of went over earlier, and they will be required fields um, within the application. So you would fill each of those out. 
and then you would attach the different required documents. So um, these are just screenshots of the actual application information. So it's just a reminder of what attachments are required for each. And then, you know, those are also listed in the job aid. Um, we do ask that the file size does not exceed 30 megabytes, which is pretty big, but I know you guys have some complex files you'll be attaching. Um, if it does, you can try to, um, you know, compress it. But if that is not working, please let us know. Um, you can email it to grants at obm.ohio.gov with your applicant name and your IRN um, and just say you're having some technical issues. So there is no limit on the number of files you can load. You know, you can load 100, 100 or more attachments if you need to. It's just the file size. Um, so if you're running into any issues, you know, feel free to ask us about it and we will um, take a look at it. So um, you would, you know, once you are at this part of the application, you'd fill out all your required attachments. And then in the next part is this contact information. So you just fill out information for two um, individuals that are associated with your school or your district and make sure the person that you list as the grant contact, um, typically it's a treasurer, that um, is someone that you would want to be contacted about the different required reporting um, and they'll actually get a login for the portal. Um, there will be future reporting requirements on the use of these funds. Um, so just make sure the grant contact is someone that you want to be doing that work to. So then at the bottom of the page, you'll be able to hit submit. If you do not see submit, if you see this form and complete button, that means one of the required fields isn't yet completed. So um, the required fields are, you know, typical to other systems. They are in red, they have a little red asterisk, and then they turn, <laughs> uh, they are just turn white once you um, complete that field. So, and then after it's submitted, you will get this um, email. This is an example from our test system, but it will, will look very similar to this. Um, and it's a registration confirmation email. So it's just letting you know we have received your application. If you don't get this email within about 24 hours, you can feel free to ask us to email us and um, ask us just to make sure that we actually did receive um, your application. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Stacey Massey. She is the lead of the Ohio Grants Partnership team um, to talk about some of the federal funding requirements. Thanks, Jessica. So I'm gonna get into a little bit of the meat as to where the funding came from. So th this funding is a portion of the state's allocation of ARPA, as many folks might be familiar with hearing about ARPA funding. So it was American Rescue Plan Act, state and local fiscal recovery funds from the US Treasury. Um, so this was allocated as part of the state's funding. It is federal funds. It does have an assistance listing number or um, what's commonly is referred to as a CFDA of 21.027. So if you're familiar with um, doing federal schedules, you have a, maybe a single audit, that is um, how you will classify this funding. And also, pr pretty much most of the uniform guidance requirements apply. For the most part, um, <clears throat> the funding, you know, is federal in nature. You'll receive it as a subgrant. There is a, um, and let's go to the next slide. We'll talk about the federal rules. There is a subaward terms and conditions that you will um, see attached that you'll need to sign and attach to your application. That will spell out all of the requirements of this funding. But mainly the um, largest requirement is federal procurement. So if you are familiar with um, receiving federal funds ever in the past, you probably had to follow federal procurement requirements. They're in um, the uniform guidance under 2 CFR 200-318 through 327. And I have a little graphic here in a little bit I'll show you that will walk through kind of a really high level what that means. But if you are awarded funding, we will do another webinar for those that are awarded funds to kind of talk through the requirements of the program. So today's really a high level to kind of let you know what the requirements will be from a federal perspective on these funds. Um, but if you are awarded funding and you, you know you haven't you had a lot of experience with federal procurement requirements, um, don't panic. We are here to help um, and we'll do more in depth on that, but we wanted to make sure that we exposed everyone 
to the requirements at a high level today so that if you do apply for the funding, you kind of know what um, to expect, as well as um, some of the um, expenditures that you may have, maybe you'll get awarded funds and you've already had some expenditures that were prior to that, um, that you would like to apply to that. So it would still need to meet these federal procurement requirements. Um, the main thing that we've been talking about today is having a unique entity identifier. And so in order to um, receive federal funds, you must have an active SAM.gov registration. So what's that look like? Let's go to the next slide. There we go. So what is a SAM.gov registration? So essentially the federal government has a system of award management where you get a unique number, which they're calling a unique entity identifier, which identifies your organization to the federal government. And um, you do have to register this number at SAM.gov um, just to and, and renew it annually just to make sure that you um, stay registered with the federal government to receive federal funds. Um, to do the application for this program, you will at least need the UEI. If you are awarded funding, then you must have that UEI registered at SAM.gov. So you do have to go to SAM.gov to get the UEI. That process isn't doesn't take very long. Um, so I recommend that, um, at least from the application standpoint, if you don't have one, that you go out and you get one right away. You start that process as part of pulling together your application materials, and you use that UEI in your application. Um, if you are awarded funds, then you can work through the process of registering it at SAM.gov. Um, if you choose to kind of go through that registration process, um, after you've submitted the application, whether you're rewarded or not, it's always a great idea to stay registered with the federal government because then you're poised to receive any other future federal funding opportunities that might come your way um, in keeping that registration renewed. I do wanna emphasize anytime you're dealing with the federal government, whether it be um, getting your UEI or getting it registered in SAM.gov, it is free. Um, even if you're applying on grants.gov direct to the federal government for federal grants, it is free. There are some, I hate to say, use the word scammers because it's kind of rough, but there are some entities that um, will, you know, contact folks who are kind of struggling with navigating the process and will offer up their third party resources to get you registered in SAM and for a fee. And I would highly recommend against doing this, although it might make your process easier right now to get registered, um, that you don't have to deal with that, you pay someone else to deal with that. Um, the General Services Administration at the federal government that runs SAM.gov has recently come out and said that they are going to remove third party administrators from registrations in the near future. So they are trying to get these company, you know, help to eliminate these companies at taking advantage of folks that are trying to register for, for free in SAM. So um, to get started, here's the link. Um, you just go to the SAM.gov website, their homepage, and you'll see a green get started button right there in the middle. And I know this picture is kind of small, but if you click that get started, you can start getting your unique entity identifier and start that process. So let's let's um, head on over to procurement. So um, this is really a high level picture and I took this from the Office of Management and Budget. Um, and if you're curious to kind of get your own picture, there's a link here, the source. And this really depicts on how the um, uniform guidance, which is really the federal regulations over the majority of grant programs that come from the federal government, and this is really picture depicts how procurement is required within those uniform regulations. And for the most part, many of you will be in the green area. Um, the green area is where it's really an informal procurement type of process um, where you don't have to put anything out for bid. But if you head into three and four, which is the yellow parts of the paw here, um, you get into more formal procurement methods, and then you could go sole source, which I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, highly discouraged unless that is your last resort, um, but that is where you have no competition. Um, but if you go to number one here, the micro purchase, kind of working around the paw or the claw here, um, micro purchase is when 
you're going to purchase something, maybe equipment for this program that's um, under $10,000. And of course, you do have to have some kind of policy that says you're going to recognize the thresholds of the federal government, the 10,000. So you could get up to 50,000, but it's, um, you have to have additional self-certifications, which I would not recommend if this is your first time using federal funds. So in that case, if you're buying something under $10,000, um, you don't need to get any quotes. You just have to equitably distribute who you go to. So you can't repetitively go back to the same supplier. Um, but you, you don't have to get quotes. So kind of like a payment card purchase. Um, you can kind of go out and purchase um, what you need for this program that's on the AEL. Um, but moving around the claw, you get to a small purchase. So anything that's between 10,000 and 250,000, then you need to start getting rate quotes. Um, and it just says an adequate number of quotes, but how I have heard auditors define that has generally been three quotes. So um, so that, at that point, you, you get quotes um, for anything that you're purchasing for this program. Let's just say you have multiple schools and you've gotten multiple allocations of 100,000 and you're going to then jointly buy all of the equipment for each of the schools at, at one procurement. Then you may get yourself into a sealed bid um, or a competitive proposal situation where um, you do have to put them out for quotes. You do have to kind of do a cost analysis to determine that the, the quotes you get, or I'm sorry, the proposals you get back or the um, bids that you get back are um, what you expected and were reasonable in cost. So um, anything that gets into that yellow area in three and four um, is probably going to be someone has multiple, a district that has multiple schools, so they're over that 100,000 and they're doing kind of a combined procurement um, for this program. Sole source is where you have maybe a unique item that you plan to purchase that there, it's only one manufacturer on the market. And this is one where I think a lot of people get stuck where they think something may be unique, but it's really proprietary. And um, there are substitutes in the market for the same type of item, but maybe you're trying to define your requirements to be more proprietary um, so that they're unique in nature. I think you just need to be very careful to stay away from brand specific things and to make sure that if you are going to say it was a sole source procurement, that it really is not available any other way and that it is unique to the market. Um, another way you could use sole source is there's no competition. And maybe you do put something out to bid and you don't get any other quotes but, or bids back but one. If you only get one proposal back, um, and you can prove that there really wasn't any other competition in the market because others have declined to bid on what um, we've gone out to RFP for. And, or your micro purchase. Again, micro purchase, you can use sole source because you're under $10,000. So this is really kind of procure in a nutshell. If you do receive funding, these are kind of the things you'll have to live by from the federal regulations as far as procurement. And so I wanted to make sure that everyone was introduced to this at really high level. So as you're applying for this, or maybe you have um, some costs that hopefully you, if you get awarded, um, they were on the AEL and you want to get reimbursed for those, you need to make sure that it follows this procurement um, clause, so to speak. And then the elements within the federal uniform guidance. Let's go to the next slide. So I just wanted to let everyone know, um, as you'll be out on the website, you should get a pop-up um, when you go out to um, grants.ohio.gov to sign up for the Ohio Connects newsletter. Um, at the Office of Budget and Management, we do that newsletter pretty frequently, usually at least monthly, um, definitely no less than quarterly. But it talks about any funding opportunities from a federal perspective um, that are up and coming. And it talks about a lot of resources from the federal um, standpoint on um, things that are going on at the federal level. So sign up for that newsletter if you're interested in getting more details about um, what we're doing at the state from a grants perspective. Also, there is a webinar if you're really curious on federal procurement requirements, you can go to our website, um, grants.ohio.gov and click on the Ohio Grants Partnership. And there is um, some slides under the Ohio Grants Summit that we did last December where um, I did a long session, I think it was about an hour on federal procurement requirements. So if you're really interested in kind of knowing about federal procurement now, um, you can go view that um, presentation that was done last December.
on um, grants.ohio.gov under um, Ohio Grants Partnership and then the Grant Summit. And then I think I'm going to turn it back over now to Jeff, who's going to close this out. Okay. Thanks, Stacy. And you know, throughout this webinar, we have referred to the website additional resources. This is just a, a screenshot of what the landing page looks like for the OFCC portion of the School Safety Grant Program. And you'll see here there's kind of two tabs in the middle, funding for prior 2021, funding for new 2022. So this is the tab we are on. There's the website link at the bottom. Uh, as you scroll to the bottom of this page, there's 2022 resources. And so this is a good compilation of the different things you would maybe be interested in as part of the program. The guidelines for the program, the security vulnerability assessment, supplemental questions, the authorized equipment list. We do have frequently asked questions that we update from, from time to time based on the questions we get, obviously. Uh, the evaluation guide, which we referred to earlier. Uh, legislation, the uh, underlying legislation. And then the, the two job aids, one that walks through the public school district experience, and the other one's for the other schools. And then finally, the terms and conditions that uh, the applicant would sign as part of the grant application. Okay, so we are into two questions, and, and after we're done here, we will actually show for specific questions which uh, group to go to, because we have our friends at Public Safety handling the authorized equipment list questions and the SVA. We have our colleagues at OBM that are going to be uh, more uh, dealing with the fiscal and the federal reporting, as Stacy mentioned, and then OFCC for any other program questions. So let me, let me ask Jen to... Um, open it up on the question side. I know we've had some questions in the chat rolling and uh, see what we wanted to address now. Yeah, so I'm going to start with one question that we've been receiving from quite a few people. Um, and so I'll just read one of them. Um, but in general, people are wanting to know that if they have multiple school buildings within one campus, so let's say they have a high school, middle school, and elementary school all in one building, would they send in three grant requests for each of those individual schools or would they send in one for the building itself? Okay, so it sounds like this is a connected K-12 with three different three different school IRNs. Uh, they, they could send in, well, as the district, they would send in one application, but they would have three separate $100,000 opportunities for each of those schools with its own IRN. Thank you. And then I also had one that was um, someone was curious about the federal, um, I believe it's the UEI. Um, but if a school is already on a free lunch or free reduced lunch um, program from the federal government, do they already have a UEI? This is Stacy from OBM. Um, yes, most likely you do. But if you are a private school receiving the funding through a, a public school, um, it is possible that you do not. So um, you can go out to that same site and there is a, a little button I think on there that allows you to find your UEI if you have one. So um, definitely search there first and make sure. Um, but it's possible you do not if you are working through a public school. Thank you. And then we also got a number of questions. Um, is this grant strictly limited to school buildings? So um, if they have a building that is used for arts or athletics, but not necessarily for daily classes, is that something that would be eligible for this grant opportunity? And this is Jeff from OFCC. So the, the eligible buildings, as is defined in law, school building is a classroom facility currently serving the educational needs of students. So it has to be a classroom facility affiliated with the school and that IRN. So those athletic facilities on their own would not be eligible, but the entire school, which includes those facilities, would be eligible. Thank you. We also had a couple of questions. Um, if a, let's say a high school or middle school was completed as an OFCC program within five years, but they have an elementary school that was not, can they still apply for the elementary school even though an OFCC project was done within the district? Yeah, so that, that's a good question. So um, the, the thing about construction within five years, that is a building by building decision. 
So if a district in their master plan had some buildings built or renovated new and other buildings were not touched as part of the program, the untouched buildings are eligible for this grant opportunity. All right, and then um, we did receive a lot of questions about the authorized equipment list. Um, so for this webinar, we'll, and actually in the next slide, we'll be providing an email. So if you have questions about the AEL, um, you'll be able to get a more in-depth answer for it. Um, but someone was curious, is the AEL list currently on the website? Yes, it's in the it's in the resources section and it's also in the application as you go through, uh, it'll be listed in those in those uh, required documents. All right, we also received a number of questions. Um, are private religious schools or um, Catholic schools, things like that, are they considered eligible for this grant? Yes, if they're chartered non-public schools, they are eligible. And we would have, uh, just to add, we would have sent an email uh, to all the schools that, that um, known to us to be eligible uh, early on. And so either the treasurer or the superintendent, the principal, whatever the grant contact is in our, in our database through the Department of Education would have received an email about the opportunity. All right, and then we also um, received a couple of questions about the SVA. Um, so some of the attendees had a, you know applied previously and completed the SVA in maybe 2019 or 2020, can they reuse those SVAs or do they need to be completely redone? As long as the SVA was completed uh, on the 2021 applicant uh, application in SVA, they can reuse that no matter what time uh, that SVA was conducted. So all they would have to do is use their old 2021 application SVA and do the two page supplemental and that can be done by whoever's uh, completing the grant application for the school. And Kyle, while I have you for the SVA, um, I can't find the question now, but there were a couple of them submitted. Um, there are other grant programs within the state that require an SVA um, that may be similar to the one that we have here. Just to confirm, people do need to apply to this grant opportunity with the SVA listed on our website. They can't reuse one from another, you know, an alternate grant program, correct? Correct. It has to be the security and vulnerability assessment that was designed for this program because it deals with the uh, past tier one items. And that's found on the OFCC's website under the grants that were shown earlier. Perfect. And Stacy, I believe you may have touched on this, but just to um, ask again, can schools apply if they don't have a UEI yet but have submitted for one? So your application should have the UEI listed on it. Um, if you are struggling with getting a UEI before the end of the application deadline, then you could enter a zero in there to get the fields in the application to submit. However, we will not be able to process and OSCC will not be able to approve applications without a valid UEI. So if you do get a UEI after that, um, you could email it to us and we could update it, but that's really the worst case scenario. So we recommend you go and get your UEI as quickly as possible. If you are struggling navigating that process, you can always reach out to us at grants at obm.ohio.gov. Um, but um, yes, you should have a UEI to get the, pro the application to fully um, be processed and awarded funding. And then, Kyle, I have another question for you. Um, we've had a couple questions kind of touching on the same thing. Um, it looks like the SEA is primarily equipment, um, but there's a number of schools that either want to have training for school staff, emergency response programs, maybe even covering, um, you know, paying for a school resource officer. Is that something that would be qualified under the um, authorized equipment list? That's a good question. I have was actually asked that this morning, I think, in an email, and I'm still looking into what uh, line item for eligibility for that. So I will find that out and hopefully we can get that added to the FAQ page or here in a minute when they show my the uh, high school safety centers grant email, 
if you have that direct question, you can email it to me and I can get that answered for them. All right, and then we do have a couple of questions. Um, people just want to confirm, they know the application window closes October 3rd, but is that window currently open? Yes. All right, and then we also have a number of schools that um, maybe have new staff or new principals or new treasurers. Um, they're wanting to locate the 2021 application and they need a specific login credential. Is that something that they need, one, need to have access to to apply to this grant? And also, if they just wanted to research it, how would they go about doing that? This is Jeff. So on the Ohio Grants uh, Partnership website, uh, there's no login credentials to view or apply, actually. Uh, so they don't need a special username or password to apply. Now, as they get through the application, it'll ask them to identify this identifying information, including the UEI. But they can go to that website and find the 2021 and both of the 2022 uh, opportunities we had mentioned. All right, and then we have had a number of questions about um, kind of retro funding or reimbursement. So if a school has already purchased the needs, the security needs that they um, had addressed, are they able to reimburse those funds if they are in line with the authorized equipment list? Yes, I believe or it's listed in the um, application, but the period of eligibility would be anything from um january 1st of 2022 through the end of 2023 um, but you know they would want to make sure they um, procured it following federal guidelines all right and then um we did get a couple of questions about that required excel spreadsheet that needs to be attached um is that listed on the um obm grants application Or where yes. can they access it to, you know, to look ahead of time? This is Jessica. It would be listed um, in the grants application, you know, for the traditional public school district. That would be the applicants who are filling that out. Um, I believe there's probably also a template on the on OFCC's website. Yep, and that, that's correct, Jessica. There's a template on our website as well. Um, so, Jeff, I do have one other one that we're getting quite a bit, um, and I'll try to, we've gotten five or six questions relating to this or kind of touching on the same subject, so I'll try to wrap them all into one. But let's say that there is um, a school building or district office that houses or uses some rooms as classrooms. Would that be considered eligible for this grant? Um. So maybe there's two parts to that question. So one is if the school, so the school and the school IRN is what's eligible for the $100,000, a school can have multiple buildings uh, attached to it, right? Uh, but, but generally the function of that school has to be classroom facilities. If there are, um, I think we had this question separately, let's say there is an administrative building that houses the security system for multiple schools with different IRNs. You know, can that be located in the school's administrative building? The answer is yes, uh, as long as those those dollars that they're requesting are still going to that school and that school's IRN. So it goes back to you know the school, the IRN, and the hundred thousand dollars per school IRN. If that and and if there's a specific uh, case, because I know there's different different configurations of schools and IRNs, please put it in the um, grants.info ofcc.ohio.gov and we can uh, address any specific situations. I, I hope that helps. And then we did get a couple of questions. Um, 
I don't know the best way to phrase it, but you know, the question that we've gotten quite a few times is, is this an all or nothing grant? So let's say a school applies for 60,000. Are they only going to get up to 60,000 or nothing? Or could they get something, could they be awarded less than that? So our, our intent would be um, that we would treat the applications as a whole amount. So if someone applied for 60,000, uh, we would intend to view that and award 60,000. You know, the, the grant terms and conditions do allow partial awards. Uh, that would not be our preference. It is possible, but I guess I would say our intent is to award as it's applied for. All right, and then we did get a couple questions too. Um, for schools that have a pre-K within their campus, um, are they able to either use funds to enhance something in the pre-K section of the school or um, does that all have to be, do the funds have to be spent on just that school program that is applying, if that makes sense? Yeah, this is probably similar to the other question where we have different configurations of buildings and programs under under one IRN. Um, so, so for those, I, mean, I, I would suggest that, that we could do a, a one-off if they have a specific case, we can um, share with them kind of what the eligibility would be based on their circumstance. And in general, if the PK is housed within a eligible school, um, that single program, the PK and the in the K-12 would be treated as one grant opportunity because they're all co-located in the same building, $100,000 limit for those together in general. But yeah, if there's specific cases, please uh, email those and we'll, we'll work through those for them. Good question. Thank you. All right, everyone. So we are um, almost at time. I know that there's still a number of questions uh, that we didn't get to. So on this slide, we have our emails. If you have a question about the SVA or the AEO, um, you can email schoolsafetygrants at dps.ohio.gov. If you have questions about procurement requirements, reporting, the technical portal, payment questions, you can forward those to grants at obm.ohio.gov. And anything else, please feel free to send it to grants.info at ofcc.ohio.gov. Um, like we mentioned earlier, we really want to make sure that everyone's able to work through this grant process. And um, if you have questions, we want to answer them. So please feel free to take a screenshot of this. As a reminder, this webinar is being recorded. Um, it will be posted on OFCC's website along with a PDF copy of the slides. So if you need the links, those will be available as well. But otherwise, we wanted to say thank you for attending. Uh, we look forward to receiving your application. And again, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach us at those emails listed there. But otherwise, we hope everyone has a great rest of their day. And thank you again for attending.